business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small business and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 70 of Small Business War Stories. And today on the show, we have a really cool show. It's a milestone show because we had uh, three different people, three guests on the show. And it was a family business in Santa Fe, New Mexico called Santa Fe Stoneworks. They're a really cool business. So we had Bill, Miles, and Anna Wordle. And they are a family business that makes uh, the crafts these amazing, amazing knives with uh, these beautiful handles of all different uh, sorts. My favorite one they had was this uh, one that had a fossilized mammoth tusk uh, uh, handle. Just absolutely gorgeous craftsmanship. And they talk a lot about really cool, interesting things like uh, what it's like to start a business in Santa Fe, uh, the idea of apprenticeship. So we, they had a great, uh, somebody who came in uh, through the ranks as an intern when they were you know, first in high school. Uh, and uh, what it means to make things here in the U.S. versus abroad. We got into a lot of different things, and also what the dynamics are of having a family business. So this is a good one. This is a part of the Soul of America tour, and I was going around the country um, and driving with my puppy, Marty Waggers. We stopped in Santa Fe, and as such, it is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a small business software that helps you with your finances. So it helps you with invoicing, payments, deposits and helps you understand your business so it's uh, it's really helpful to do that because then you can spend all your time actually running your business and not worrying about the accounting on the back end I mean, you still have to pay attention to it and file your numbers and all that but at least you know they're right because you're using fresh books and they calculated that the amount of time you spend is about two working days per month that you would be doing all this boring numbers work instead of focusing on your business so you should check them out. Go to freshbooks.com slash war stories and enter small business war stories in the how did you hear about us section that helps them, it helps us, it helps you. Everybody wins. And this, like every podcast, is brought to you by proven.com. Proven.com is a company I founded and it is a small business hiring tool that helps you with all of your needs uh, to organize your hiring. And it's uh, very useful. We have thousands of customers that use it. Check it out at proven.com. And we also have a great, great resource, a blog.proven.com. If you're a small business, you should go check it out because there we have lots of different tips on how to run your business, uh, how to hire, uh, what software to use, uh, all kinds of different uh, topics that, that I think will be interesting to you. Now, if you have ideas of things we can cover on this podcast and things we can cover on the, on the blog, uh, email us. Please do email us directly. Now, I want, if you email us, you know, make it, make it thoughtful and like make it, give us a good idea. Uh, we do get a lot of emails from people who um, are obviously mass emailing every single podcast I've ever heard of. Um, so those we're not that interested in. But uh, if you actually listen to the show and have ideas, we definitely, definitely uh, will get back to you and want to implement your feedback. So do get back to us, podcast at proven.com. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Santa Fe Stoneworks in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we are live here in beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this morning, I have the honor to sit here with Bill, Anna, and Miles Wardle of Santa Fe Stoneworks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Here. Yeah, we had, this is the biggest show we've ever done with four people total on the, on the show. So, <laughs> right. You guys are, uh, this is a milestone for small business war stories. All right. Wonderful. So you guys have an iconic uh, presence here in Santa Fe. I mean, I, I'd already heard about you guys from Aaron at Tres Cuervos Leather Works. And, it's, and you know, she's seen, seen some of your works. You have some beautiful, beautiful, uh, you know, uh, knife works and, and other things here in the shop. What inspired you to start this? So this is a family business, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about what that means later on. But what? Uh, how did this get started? Well, I'm, I'm an old IBM salesman that ran away from St. Louis in the late 60s. Okay. And after two years of traveling, I ended up down here in Santa Fe. Thought I'd died and gone to heaven. But nobody really knew about Santa Fe in the early 70s. And I had a girlfriend, and she was a jeweler, and she needed what's called heshi beads, which are 
Santa Domingo Indians make them. They're necklaces with beads out of shell. And so we found that there were a lot of people looking for them and nobody was making them. So we started making them in our house. Within six months, I had 20 people making uh, a hishi in a building out right out here on Airport Road. Yeah. And I did that business for five years. And we did some overlay, inlay work with pendants that we hung on the necklaces. And uh, the Philippines knocked everybody off and the price for hishi went from $20 to $1.10 mm. in three months. So I sold that business. I broke up with the girlfriend, sold the business to the IRS, <laughs> and, and I squirreled away enough money to go live in a house for about six, eight months. But I always had this thing in the back of my head of inlaying stuff besides jewelry. I realized the whole town was doing jewelry. Why should I compete against the whole town? Yeah. So I first wanted to make pocket knives, but I really didn't have the money to buy knives to inlay them in my house. I had bought some equipment. And after screwing around with somebody who said they could make knives, and I figured out that he couldn't, uh, I went, well, I better make some hash pipes because I know I can sell them. <laughs> so I had a woodworker friend, and I started cutting up pipe blanks and inlaying them and selling them for three bucks. I met somebody that backed me into a shop. Within, another, within a year in my house, we moved out into a shop, and uh, three years later, we would had 25 people making 150,000 hash pipes. Wow, that's a lot of hash pipes. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan closed down the head shop business. By then, I met somebody that had cheap knives from China. We could buy them for a dollar, take the handle off, inlay them, and sell them. So we started doing that. We had gear shift knobs that we were doing. We had pen sets, boxes, uh, letter openers, which was the hash pipe without the bowl. Yeah. And... Uh, from that point on, we met the Japanese, and then they started making the knife for us, and the rest is history. And it, it just, just it just went from there to nothing but knives. And it just morphed into men's gifts somewhere along the line. It was just, I don't know if that's what you set out to do, but no. it morphed into men's gifts, and that's we, what we've been. My partner and I, at the time, we were doing like 40 craft shows one year. Uh, just He'd leave, I'd, I'd come back, he'd leave, I'd come back, and we had people running the shop. And we both came back from two shows one time, looked at each other, went, my God, we're making men's gifts. Okay. We didn't realize that. We went, that's our hook. We're selling knives to women who buy don't. men's gifts. And that's they don't normally buy knives. So we were creating a whole different market. And that's what got the cutlery industry interested in us. Okay. Meanwhile, my kids were growing up, and they fought coming in here. They'd come in here and work for... A little bit, and then leave, and then come in and work. Anna moved to San Diego for uh, two years. I know I didn't work for you before I moved to San Diego. Okay, I started working for you when I moved back from San when Diego. When she moved back, I guess uh, temporarily. But I didn't want to. It was the last thing I wanted to do at the time. You didn't want to be in the family. I didn't business. want to work with my dad. I didn't want to work here. I was um, studying water treatment and trying to take some classes. And Bill had just lost his shipper. And I had some shipping experience from a previous job. And so he was like, please, please, I need somebody. And I said, well, you let me go to my classes. And it was the only job that would be flexible enough to let me do these courses. Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> but within six months, I completely gave up water. I knew this was everything that I was supposed to do that I'd been looking for my whole life, trying to figure out what avenue was right for me. And I did think about leaving, and I interviewed somebody to replace me. And afterwards, I literally went into the bathroom and cried. And that's when I knew I shouldn't go anywhere. This is what I was supposed to do. That's awesome. Then Miles came into the business a little later. Yeah, I think my reasons were a little bit different. It was really to keep me out of trouble. Okay. <laughs> As you know, I entered the business when I was 15 for, was, for a yeah. summer job. I worked here for a good solid three months and figured that this was hard work and I wanted to get out of it. <laughs> uh, found a jeweler that paid me double or if not triple more than what my father would pay me. Dad. Uh, yeah, well, he you we, start him at the bottom. We started at the very, very start bottom. Start at the bottom like and, everybody else. And I, and, and I was able to get a, an idea of the jewelry industry. Um, I did, did a lot of stamp work for Concho Belts with a, a known jeweler in downtown Santa Fe who would sell on the plaza. Cool. Um, and then we transitioned into the restaurant industry as it was much better pay than anything else and better hours. Um, and after graduation of high school, 
Um, I had a, a major sh shoulder surgery. I had an accident when I was in my teens with a motorcycle. Mm. Figure that. And um, it kind of displaced me, and I didn't know what to do in life. Um, and so um, I was at a semester at college, and after the surgery was midway, I wasn't able to return um, and decided to give the Stoneworks another shot. Um, definitely there were many trying years, as I believe when Anna and I entered the sh Stoneworks, that um, Stoneworks hit, 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 uh, hit its peak in the 90s. As in the 90s, that's when the American handmade craft movement was quite large. Okay. Um, and it was very involved, something new. There was mm -hmm. a lot of people out there making great quality goods. Um, in the early 2000s, um, transition of the shop from a lot of old vets transitioned out and was m mostly a newer crew. Um, as you know, in each department that I've been in within our rock cutting, assembly, grinding, and finishing department, um, it pretty much started from bare bones basic. There, there wasn't a lot to learn from from the previous employees as they weren't there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from from my experience, um, the first 10 years was kind of reestablishing, rebuilding, over. starting over. Um, and I think a lot of that was because we were affiliated with an American cutlery company named Camillus. And they're the ones who bought into Bill's vision and supported us and where we were 100% American made goods. And they really taught us and knives. And they taught us how, how to produce before. knives. So you guys make the knife soup to nuts here or do you no, buy no. it? Okay, we, buy, uh, we buy the knife, we call it a skeleton, it's just assembled. And then we do all the finish work. Okay. I mean, to make the knives, you gotta have foundries and things like that. And that's, right. that's not what, yeah. we're really jewelers working on pocket knives. Right. And so that's so the that's way, what you that's saw the folks went. too. We we're talking before we started about you know these guys bench made in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Oregon City. Well, we uh, do private label work for Case Cutlery is our biggest co uh, customer. Yeah, Boker, uh, Browning. Uh, we've Benchmade. done work with Benchmade. Benchmade, we did their 110th anniversary Harley Davidson knife. Oh yeah, out of Mammoth Tooth and Jet. I think all said and done. Um, they yeah. did about a hundred, I think, a hundred and ten pieces, and uh, those knives were selling for about eighteen hundred dollars a piece, only yeah. at Harley Davidson dealerships. dealerships. Wow! And they sold out within two hours of their Harley Davidson. Show. I want to, I want to add one thing about Miles and Anna. Uh, at one point, they came to me and said, "Dad, we went to a score meeting last night." Uh, SCORE is the senior core of retired engineers uh, and, and retired executives. And we had about six or seven of them that were retired here in Santa Fe running programs for people who want to get into business. The kids went to a meeting and, and talked to them about the transition of the company from me to them. And uh, uh, the first thing they said was everything that they said I'd already told them. So it validated what I had said in the past. They start. I start to get respect. I'll be damned. <laughs> <laughs> How long did that take, Dad? Uh, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> if I still have it, I don't know. <laughs> still working on it. But we spent six months with these uh, retired executives in a monthly meetings, talking about the transition. And the first thing that they told me, they took me aside and said, "It's not going to work. It's a ninety-five percent failure rate." It just won't work. To transition, to family. transition, transition. to your children. It's historically, very historically, it does, it does not work. That's the first thing it they told me. It's very hard. Six months later, they <clears throat> took me aside and said, you're a lucky man. We think you not only have one, but you have two that are going to work. And that's unheard of. And I think he's right. You know. Wow. And I, I think a lot of that is credit uh, to Bill and the way he had us, you know, in, introduced into the business, as we weren't given, we were not given a silver spoon. Yeah. Um, we started at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. Um, and worked our way up. Um, and I think from the transition of when Anna and I started to where we are now, um, is evidence of pure and simple hard work and yeah. resilience of continually to fall and fail and dust yourself and get back up mm -hmm. and try it again with yeah. a new approach. Well, um, what, what were you going to share? You had something. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, SCORE is a beautiful program. It's nationwide. Any small business can go. It's free yeah. counseling. And, um, you know, it really, it, you know, it, the, 
they'll work with lawyers, they'll get you know retired lawyers to work with you on legalities of starting your business or problems you're having, accountants, and you know they really, it, it's a really good small business uh, resource that I don't I think should is really known. Get in touch with it. You should. It's free. It's, it's, it's all and free. And it's free. Yeah. You know, That's it's free business thing. counseling. Yeah, yeah, but it's something that as our, our audience is a lot of small business folks, exactly. so it's something that I think could be really valuable. That's why I wanted to say something about that, you know, because it is. It was very, tre it was tremendously helpful to get the ball rolling and make us think about things in a different light or okay. what and we it, needed to do to go forward. It got me thinking about it. Gee, they might really take yeah. over. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Which they've done now. They pretty much have. I'm 74 years old. In the last seven or eight years, I've, I've cut back. And now I like to say I come in late and leave early. You're yeah. chairman, <laughs> chairman Emeritus. Yeah. Chairman Emeritus. We try to get him to stay home on Wednesdays, and he won't. He just can't. He's, yeah. he's just, you know, he's been doing this for so long. He's been, he's gotten up every morning for 39 years and come into this bill or to this business. Yeah. And checked everything and gotten it rolling and which, I don't which if you're anything like me, when you were a kid you took for granted and now you're like, Wow. Yeah. Yes. No, definitely. Yeah. I, that I don't do anymore. They they got they're the ones that Miles is the one that really comes in early. Anna has three children, the oldest are a pair of four year old twins. Wow, congratulations. Uh, boys. Thank you. So, uh, and a little girl that's cute as could be. So she's got her hands full till about eight thirty or nine herself getting them off to daycare. But, uh, and then I sound her in later on and I try to get out of here by 3.30. Okay. So let's dig into this whole family business a little bit more. Um, it's something that we haven't really gotten deep into the show in the you know, 70 shows that we've taped. Um, what are some of the pros and cons? I mean, there, there must be things that are great about it and things that are challenging about it. The hardest thing is when you disagree, you disagree fiercely. And, you know, it's just like when you fight with your sibling or you high fight with emotions. your parents. High emotions. Always high emotions. The best part is, you know, the love is always there and we're always going to find a solution. There's absolutely nothing that will stop us from finding a solution. And even when we get into a huge disagreement and think polarly opposite ways, we walk away from it, come back and meet in the middle. And that's not always true in business where you don't have that family. A lot of companies have trouble with financial securities, uh, mm -hmm. meaning the money that passes through and making sure it stays in the company and not your accountant's pocket. Yeah. And I've always put family in charge of finances. You know, you can trust them. At the end of the day, you can trust your family. Mm -hmm. And and you can disagree and be mad and be and scream at each other which we've done plenty of <laughs> but at the end you know we everybody loves everybody and, and we're yeah. there for our for and, for the good of the business not just for yourself mm -hmm. and and it, our our family business takes on a different meaning because i truly believe that all of us every person that works in this building with us is part of the stoneworks family this isn't about bill miles and i how many employees you have 14. 14. Mm -hmm. okay. 14. Um, we got two of them who have been here for 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, another set that have been here for 12 years, 9 years, 8 years, 6 years, 5 years. The newest employer is a year. Uh, Sean's 9 months. 9 yeah. months. 9 months. And he was added on to the crew. Um, we did not. He wasn't re replacing He somebody. wasn't replacing anybody. Here's an increase. Um, in so it, 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 it is a family oriented business throughout the entire shop. Um, is, is the way that we believe because the stoneworks wouldn't be the stoneworks if it wasn't for Everybody. the family of stoneworks which goes beyond the last name Wordle and it goes to everyone that puts their best foot forward day in and day out to create a unique one-of-a-kind exceptional product that can be purchased through all categories of income from a forty dollar knife to a ninety dollar knife to a hundred and ten dollar well hundred and eighty dollar knife yeah. to five hundred dollars. So knife. I'm terrified to ask, but the one that Aaron has, it's an amazing uh, Damascus steel blade with uh, like how much is that one? That one was I think was three ten. Oh Jesus. Three ten. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was it. Yeah, it was a it was a Damascus <laughs> Kershaw uh, with Alabama Damascus and uh, fossilized woolly mammoth ivory. Yeah. Um, inlay. 
it's an amazing, exceptional amazing, knife. Amazing, yeah. amazing yeah. Yeah. knife. Exceptional knife. So let's talk about so what the so you it, it, let's segue a little bit into the product. So the product you said you buy different knives from different people, remove the handles, and then you guys do a lot of the finish work on that, right? Well, in in, in essence, we we have a product line that we bring in under our own label, Santa Fe Stoneworks, and we work in conjunction. Um, with a Japanese manufacturer. Okay. So um, they basically white label for you. So exactly, right. yeah, yeah. The, 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 they're the ones who are producing the skeletons for us. Yeah. Uh, but when we do receive the skeletons, everything um, is, is pretty much in the rough shape. So um, when we receive the knives, we go through our quality control process um, in our prep division to make sure everything's up to standards before we apply our handle treatments to it. Um, and then once we apply our handle treatments to it is when our shop turns into a hybrid lapidary jewelry inlay shop mm -hmm. into a knife making shop. And then that's in our grind department is where you're going to see all your top notch grinders, um, various different contact wheels, uh, platen grinding. So you guys finish the knives. Too. We do all the finish work. So then the final quality of it does end up in the grind department um, because you know the only thing you can do in the grind department um, to inhibit the knife is to over grind it which you know a lot of the knives that we receive are just in the raw form so we grind down the rivets we, we flush out the bolsters the liners um, we have to notch the lockbacks within there um, so the function of the knife depends on how good your finish works of course is. because and you can over ground your skeleton you take a knife uh, which is a working mechanism is actually a very highly engineered product and glue a bunch of rock and stone on it and put it through grinders and buffers, you can screw it up really quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have yeah. many a time. Exactly. You know, uh, when we first got hooked up in the 80s with uh, Camilla's Cutlery Company, they came in here and took a look at us and just went, holy cow, look what they're doing. <laughs> wow. And uh, we, they said, you guys need to get the right equipment down here, and they, they helped us provide that. They brought people in that taught us how to deal with the they knife so that we don't ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. Their, yeah. Knife Finishing a good knife is actually their, a very difficult thing Their to do. knife engineer visited so much he married my shipping clerk. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> to I this mean, day. Story. Yeah. yeah. And he now works with the A.G. Russell uh, Catalog, which is a great big knife company in uh, Arkansas. He's their uh, right-hand man to the owner. A.G. Russell is a very well-known custom knife maker, one of the original members of the Knife Makers Guild. Okay. And he's also in the Blade uh, Knife Makers Hall, Hall of Fame. fame. Yeah. You know, wow. he, he and his wife. His wife is the only one. Yeah, his, his wife really runs the business now. How do you guys sell your products? So, what are most of your sales? Are most of your sales people who hear about you and, and come here? Word or is it... St trade shows. Okay, but hold on. So do you also have like a direct component? And do you have... We well, do how, both. How does that break down? Yeah, we do, well, we do trade shows, number one. We've been doing them since the 70s, from California to Seattle to New York to Philadelphia to Chicago. All the big, major wholesale trade shows in the handmade section okay. of, of, of the shows normally. We also work the SHOT Show, which is the big gun and, gun and knife show in Las Vegas once a year. Cool. And then uh, we do retail craft shows. Uh, my wife and I, when we started to retire, uh, bought an RV and we started working craft shows. And we did that for eight years. Last year and a half ago, we sold it because it became too much like work. And we decided we better just slow down. Okay. So, uh, but, but because of that, we created a lot of retail business. Okay. We have a very big website that's very active, and we do a lot of business out of, on our website, okay. which is so retail. people can order your products directly. Yeah. Correct. Got it. We, uh, you know, we kind of break all small business rules. You're either supposed to wholesale yeah. or retail. You're not supposed to try to compete with yourself in that sense. And we do everything. Yeah, many, many people have been talking to do do both things. Mm -hmm. And it seems like more and more people are able to balance that. Yes. Uh, as, as well as do, do uh, work where we don't get any credit. Yeah. Uh, Case Cutlery will do three, 5,000 knives a year. We've been doing that since 2000. And uh, 2001, right after 911. Or 2002, I guess we started. Yeah, 2002. Uh, and, you know. They don't say we do the work. Uh, they Open. send us the knives. We do the inlay work, send it back to them. They do the finish work, the final finish work, and all the marketing. And the same thing with Boker, the same thing with Brownie. Is that like those knives that are sitting here yes. that are about to yep. get shipped to Germany? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So those knives are going to be finished by them. By them. And yeah. what you guys yeah. did with those is put the handles in. Put the, the mammoth, mammoth tooth. tooth in. Yeah. 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 
exactly. And then mo most of the dive cutlery companies we work with, though, we do the finish work. Uh, like Case Cutlery, we, we do the final finish. What they do is they dome their bolsters and sh high polish their blades and sharpen the blades. And okay. That, then that's it. Within that, um, with Browning, we do 100% completion mm -hmm. with them um, in, con in conjunction with a cutlery company out of Italy who okay. makes the knife. So there's basically the so there's it's like a dual white label where you guys are doing the finish the 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 actual initial knife comes from Italy yep. and it gets branded brown and sold exactly okay. yeah so it's amazing to see how far that knife travels because yeah. we know all suppliers <laughs> and we know the the, the best uh, retail customer who sells those items wow. and just the chain effect how how, how I had goes. to get there um, you know it, it is quite amazing um, and I think uh, you know one of the best things that Anna Anna and I have done and look to do um, is bringing in our own branded knives that we believe are at the highest quality as some of the names you hear about as Benchmade, Spyderco, okay. so on and so forth, um, using our ability and um, Bill's networking that he's created uh, over 39 years of being in the industry um, to know which cutlery companies to work with okay um and which direction do we want to go within the business okay. i always used to take knives that were already being made and in them because i was more into the cutting of the rock and the and the design of the handle and everything and i kind of got dragged into the knife business it was kind of like you know and they wondered what are you doing here you're yeah. making knives that are just too damn pretty we wouldn't use that but yeah. eventually they changed their mind now my children are actually designing knives, and that's a big step. I'm very proud of the fact of what they've done. We have two models out. We're working on a third model. So you guys design them, and then you and have them made by a different small company in Japan. Okay. Uh, making them for us uh, through our specs. Oh. And then, wow. Then redesigning them. Most of the, the two models we make or titanium bodied knives and they're button locks. So I have one in my hand right here. This is beautiful. And uh, tell me a little bit more about this handle. What is this handle? I'll like? let Miles do that. So that one is a, a solid titanium frame. It's machined, uh, machined out of one uh, billet piece of titanium. Okay. Um, the handle material is going to be fossilized mammoth tooth. Okay. Um, the blade steel is going to be VG10 steel, which is kind of a high-end factory standard steel that uh, Spyderco has, has made quite popular over the years. It's yeah. been their number one go-to steel um, and, and proven steel with that. Um, the design is kind of a mi uh, minimalist design. Yeah, um, it's it, beautiful. It, it, my, in my mind, the category that that knife falls into would be a, a gentleman's carry knife. Um, you know, yeah. either, either you know anything from jeans to slacks to shorts. Um, it's got a really good blade steel to it, so it can handle any cutting and operational jobs that you need it to do on an everyday basis. Yeah. And the fact that it weighs 2.3 ounces. Yeah. Um, a lot of knives now in the industry are these huge clunky knives that are you know solid titanium with you know every little bell and whistle you could think of and and, and when you put it in your pocket it weighs down your pocket it's the only thing you can put it you'd almost be better hitting somebody over the head with it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and in my eyes aesthetically the form and functions of that knife um, hit every note I think that Ann and I have been looking for yeah um, and then just the quality of it um, is exceptional the manufacturer we work uh, very closely with yeah. believed in our vision um, yes, he did. He believed in us very early on, and he approached us, and uh, we didn't have the money to work with him at the time. Yeah. And when we or did have the money, he jumped. Time. He, you know, he jumped up, and he's helped us tremendously with our designs as well. Yeah, this is beautiful, and also it's interesting. The uh, what do you call this? The spine of the knife. Yeah, the spine yeah, of the blade. It's, it's a really interesting. Uh, it's not something I've seen the way you do this. The, mm -hmm. the kind of rounded. It, mm -hmm. it kind of lends a little bit of that like sleek, like elegant design. Exactly, to it. and, and that's where we like to. S s that's where we like to sit is on the sleeker end. I mean, Miles and I both like really clean lines, not yeah. busy, not too too much out of control, you know. Because we also we want the material to speak for the knife itself as well. We don't want to take away from that, because that is kind of the the key aspect of Santa Fe Stoneworks is our ability to work with you know natural exotic materials that any other cutlery uh, company would run away from. And mm -hmm. that's why they come to us to have exotic materials to be put on their branded knives. 
um, is because of our far extensive knowledge of working with and materials that just should not yeah. be on a pocket so knife. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So how did you, so you guys make, you have some really interesting materials that you use on your handle. Mm -hmm. So you talk about fossilized mammoth tooth. Uh, there are other uh, really fascinating materials that you use. Like, may, can you maybe give me a list of the most popular ones you well, use, and how do you how do you even find that? Let me put you a little background. When after I've been doing jewelry for a while, my father had passed away, and uh, I knew my grandfather was a stone cutter, but I didn't really put it together. The one of the last times I saw my mother, she told me she said, "Well, you know, you're doing what you you found your roots." I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "Well." You were, you know, my my grandfather was a stone cutter in the early 1900s. Worked on the Budweiser Building in St. Louis, and the Jeff and the Capitol in Jefferson City, Missouri. Lived in a tent to send his five children to college because he knew that handwork was out. So my dad was a chemical engineer. All the other, all his other uh, siblings were engineers or teachers. And when I was growing when I was uh, educated. I was basically educated to be an IBM salesman, which I was. Mm -hmm. I was a good one too, but it wasn't what I really wanted to do. I wasn't happy there, and and I came down here and started doing rock, and cutting rock, and I kept going. You know, it just really felt right. And my mother looked at me and said, "Well, of course it's right." Said your last name, Wordle. You come from Upper Bohemia, and you come from a family of stone cutters. And your last name was the name of the Stonecutter Guild's logo. When they were done with the building, they, they were construction people. When they were done with the building on the Carter Stone, they put a vertel, which was the union signal signature or logo, that they worked on that building. And wow. I just went, well, hell, I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I can put that confusion away. Now I just want to do it as best I can. Just push forward. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think... You know, the materials Bill started with were typical jewelry materials yeah. from the Hishi beads, turquoise, malachite, lapis, azurite, Shelf mother thing. of pearl, jet, things like that. And then you, I don't know where you first found, I think it was at the Tucson show, you first found dinosaur bone. And that mm. was our first really exotic fossilized material. And nobody would touch dinosaur bone because it's extremely hard. I mean, it's... it's is it brittle as well? Yes. Yes, but it's it's, it's like cutting it's like into quartz. a quartz or shaping a quartz. It's very, very, very difficult. It very raises seven on a hardness scale when you're grinding the knives per sand belt you may get 20 to 30 knives with all the other materials you may get three two four two to four with dinosaur bone it just eats your paper it eats your blades it's difficult to cut it's difficult to shape it's difficult to work with and bill and john really you know saw that there was a niche there you know where wow you can have a piece of a real dinosaur and in your home and and you know they marketed it as such and we did it for like 20 years oh yeah or something and then case cutlery asked us if we would do woolly mammoth tooth and we'd never worked with it before that's what this is mm -hmm. yes and so we uh we got we found a supplier we started working with it it was a very hard learning curve um, lost Countless, countless of knives. Yeah, we lost a lot of money that Lots way. of money. As you do when you're <laughs> learning what, what, something what was new. The, what was the learning curve? It was, walk, walk me it was what did fragile. You um, yeah, the, it's the, hard and soft. The, the supplier we were working with out of Texas didn't have <clears throat> the best stabilization process, and that's what needs to be done with this fossilized material. It was porous. <clears throat> and it tended to breathe. So um, our final finishing grind method is using water. With our grinders, and if the if the tooth isn't stabilized well, it tends to soak up the water and then and contracts expands. and expands and just pops off. Pops off. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you're talking so you've about done all the work, and the handle just cracks and, and pops and off. And at that point, <laughs> that was by far the most expensive material we worked oh, with. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah. each loss was was it's just a large a, loss. A large loss that you're not going to you know rehabilitate mm -hmm. because we don't have a stock supply of it, and it's the first time we've worked with this material. For a company that provide us the knives, so they're not the not they're not even the knives that we owe. So yeah, you're out twofold, the knife not, and the material. Yeah, wow. they're not the knives. That meanwhile, meanwhile, we I was doing a show in New York. I hooked up with an old sales manager of Camilla's Cutlery, who had now was out of business. They went out of business ten years ago, and along with Shrey, they were part of that whole family of knives. And uh, he talked me into into working a show in Europe with him. 
uh, and, the, and I said, well, that's too much money for me right now. He said, the Department of Economics of the state will help you. Mm -hmm. And he helped me get in contact with the Economic Department of the state of New Mexico, and they paid for my booth. Economic Development Department. Development Department. So instead of me going, though, uh, I thought I'd send Miles, because he was the future. And Anna. <laughs> No, you we had decided, kids. Excuse me, no, you're you're getting old. Um, we he we we finally went to a Germany show. I'd been working for my dad for almost 18 years and never been to Europe and always wanted to go to Europe for a show. We signed up for the Europe for the Germany show as soon as I got pregnant with my twins. <laughs> so Miles, so Miles went, went ahead, and that's where he met a supplier from Denmark at that show for fossilized for material. fossilized materials. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and at the show, um, you know, it, it, it was definitely, um, you know, an out of the box experience. I've never traveled to Europe. Yeah. Um, and to work a trade show where there's probably 25 to 50 languages being spoken because it's the European trade show um, yeah. version of the shot show in the U.S. And on the last day, I had a gentleman walk by our glass case. It was a, a double towered glass case. And um, I saw him looking at some of our fossilized materials, and he tended to walk away. Then he came back and was sitting there looking at him, and he looked at us and um, you know, asked us as a company, do you guys work with Mammoth Tooth, or do you just resell it? Said, no, yes, we work extensively with this fossilized material. And he said, oh, really? Well, I'm a supplier of it. And I said, well, great. I have a supplier. <laughs> There's in, nothing in America. America. In, in the U.S. Yeah. And he said, well, I, don't, I think you might find this interesting. Let me go back and grab some samples. Um, so he came back about approximately 10 to 15 minutes later, um, and as we were just explaining our story about porous mammoth tooth that tends to break and chip and, and bow, um, you have to be very, very careful with this material. And we were always very cautious whenever we would be handling it without a backing or when it was not on a knife on, on the surface. Um, and with that said, when he, when he came around the corner with some material, he came over to sit next to our table and threw the pieces down on the, on the table. And, and I they just didn't break. had to stop myself from trying to grab them because I was like, what are you doing? They should have broken. And, <laughs> and they landed and they were perfectly intact. And I picked up the piece of uh, fossilized yeah. material and I could just see how well the material has been stabilized. And Talk about a demo. What huh? I mean, <laughs> and it was a great demo. And um, you know, in reference to stabilizing, for people who don't know, it's pretty much injecting an epoxy or acrylic resin into a porous material. I was going to ask you about that. What to, does it to, mean? To, 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 to stabilize. To strengthen it. Hence, stabilize. Under, under about 5,000 pounds um, of pressure and, to and, pull it in. And it's not as simple as that as they, they've procured... Um, their own chemical makeup that will so is, best it, is it vacuum based? Suit. It's vacuumed and then hydraulic based. Okay. So there's two different methods that, that this intense. company that this company performs out of Denmark. Um, and after that, you he, came, I was you, able to buy some samples. Well, you came home and you were like, "Well, should we try to buy a small shipment from this guy in Europe?" And you and I both were kind of like, "Why? We have this. We have an American supplier. The shipping, international shipping, is difficult. It's expensive." We decided to buy about two or three thousand dollars worth just to start, and we got it in. Scraps. We and scraps. We, we got it, we bought his scraps, and we got it in. We started working it, and then it was a five thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar order. I mean, we just he our entire supply of mammoth fossilized materials came from him because the quality was just like nothing so we good. had seen. And, and he saw our ability to process and handle this material and yeah. do it justice, and um, and we owe a lot of gratitude. Um, to our um, collaboration with him because he's helped us grow our ability to source finer, nicer, more precious fossilized materials. So if I get this right, this is an American designed, American Finnish, Japanese knife with a Danish material. Well, in oh. Siberia. Russia. Oh, Russia. Oh, no. si Siberia. Okay. Eastern uh, Russia. Poland. Russia. Poland. 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 Yeah. Po Polish material. Material that's been stabilized in Denmark, Denmark. and then okay. shipped to the U.S. to be processed. So let's just say it's the most worldly knife ever. That is, ever a, meet. that is a very worldly <laughs> knife. And, and as an American business, you know, we, we take pride in that. But I think one thing that people need need to you know learn within that is it, it is a world economics. Um, there are parts and components that come through all over the world, yeah. um, and and I think we. As a company, we do a good job in embracing that 
because you need all aspects coming through. Yeah. You know, did you we know, look so at it? We look at it as America made because it's eighty percent value added on right here. Okay. That makes okay, it, that's yeah. a really interesting thing because I, as I've been traveling around the country, I've been meeting a lot of folks that uh, make things. So we're talking about mm -hmm. Truman Boots, uh, the ones I'm wearing, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron that makes this uh, bracelet I'm wearing, uh, actually everything else too. But uh, the, there's this movement of people who want to make things in the U.S. And then there's sometimes you have uh, Mystery Ranch in Montana is a good example where they make, they have a facility here that makes their backpacks, but they also design it, uh, they design them here, but they also make, um, backpacks abroad, which also ties into what we talked about. The backpacks that make abroad are the ones they use in their distribution network because then they can give enough margin mm -hmm. for their stockists sure. uh, where selling directly. Sure. Uh, it, so uh, selling directly is done more with, it, with their domestic products, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, how do you guys, it, it seems like you guys are kind of marrying all this and, and it's interesting what you said about 80% of the value is added here. So you're adding, you have, you're employing people, you're a part of this community, exactly. but you're pulling in from the world and pushing out to the world. I presume yeah. that these knives get sold. Number worldwide. one, Mother of Pearl does not come from the United States. So I, almost, I had to begin with go to the Philippines to get it because that's where it comes from. Yeah. And a lot of uh, Malachi comes from the Congo. No. Yeah. It doesn't come lapis from the United from States. Afghanistan. Lapis from Afghanistan. Or Chile. This one's Chilean mm -hmm. lapis. Or right Chile, Chile, I, I grew up Chile. in Chile. So yeah. Chile. Yes. Or Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Well, I bought this one in Chile, yeah. so I'm hoping that it's <laughs> from Chile. I'm sure it is. Yeah. No. You um, know, but so I, was, I couldn't help it but, but be worldwide yeah. on, on the materials we were working with. Yeah. yeah. You know. It, you know, I, I believe that, that our brand is more so american made than even a lot of people in the u.s that say they're american made okay. you know if you look at ford ford is just assembled in the u.s all components are sourced from all over the world the engines are produced in mexico the harnesses are done in china and what they do they design and acquire all raw components and assemble in the u.s um you know i don't feel i, I feel like you know our situation is even more hands-on than the situation um, and, and that cause just because of the sheer amount of labor and uh, you know American you know um, hands that are on these pocket knives well, as Bill says we produce if 80% if not 95% of the value done here uh, what we do in our building with the raw materials they're all hand cut so they're not put through some machine that just pops them out this is two inches by one inch by a quarter inch thick everything's done by hand and you're gonna have very you have variation in that. You have variation in the natural materials. You can't predict what's gonna happen inside the middle of the rock as you're cutting it. It can look gorgeous on the outside and you get to the middle and it cracks and it's you know, it, it's yeah. it, it's no good. Um, and then everything is hand flat everything is flat sanded by hand. It's not put into a machine where it tells you, yes, you have your angles perfectly flush and straight, you're not gonna have any gaps. Everything's done by hand. Yeah. You know, it's a very old school way of, of the way How do you guys measure tolerances in that process? It's all through hand eyes. Hand and eyes. And my yeah. eyes and calipers. Yeah, <laughs> calipers. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean if you you don't take a caliper to a gap in between a piece of malachite and silver, do you? Yeah. Okay. Well, you're getting you're getting crazy on me, but um, so it's all it's all handmade and all those variations. You we could not outsource our company to China and be able to no. tell somebody how to do our business, right, yeah. you know. Um, and we I, I, we actually looked at that in the '80s with my old partner John, who I we, yeah, John and I were together for over 20 years. He left in 1999, and. Uh, but we looked at taking it to Mexico. We looked at taking it to the Philippines. But you got to live there if you want to do it. And I don't yeah. want to live in either area. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer to live right here. Mm -hmm. And I like part of what I wanted to do was to provide a good paying job in this town. Yeah, let's talk now, about I'm that. I'm not <laughs> being silly. That was one of my goals. It wasn't to just line my pockets. Yes, I wanted to make a living. I wanted to be proud of what I was doing and happy with what I was doing. But I wanted to provide good jobs for the people that were here because there weren't many Sandy in this people. town. It's a tough town. Especially yeah. in the early 70s. Yeah. There was nothing here. You had, when I came here, I saw you had the government because it's a state capital mm -hmm. and you have the fe a lot of federal money here with the, with the labs and all the other military Sunny things. Dad. You have tourism, which is hotels and restaurants. 
and then you have the arts. And so of all of them, I guess I'm in the arts. I, at one point, I was probably one of the bigger manufacturers in town with 10 people. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but there was there is no manufacturing here, or very little, and there still is very little. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's a service-oriented tourist town that lives off the government tip. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So you know. how... Tell, Talk to me more about what, how it's important for you guys to be a part of the community here in Santa Fe and well, being a community-based business. What, what we try to do is we try to offer um, a well-paying job with a lot of benefits. For a small business, we offer an extreme amount of benefits. You know, we're not, we're not legally binded to do any, any of them. You know, uh, after one year service, you get one week off paid vacation. We shut down during Christmas because everything dies. And so everybody gets to be at home with their family for Christmas, which yeah. everybody loves. We do that. We do that, too. I yeah. prove it on my company. Everybody gets the entire week between yeah. Christmas yeah. and New Year's off. Exactly. You know, and um, after you, you acquire sick days, we after one year, you get paid uh, four hours. Uh, Sick day. holiday yeah. well holiday, holiday pay for the four holidays we take in a year after three years you get paid eight hours for those holidays um, after three years you get two weeks full vacation we have health insurance that we pay 60% of we have dental insurance we have a simple IRA plan we have a lot of perks and benefits every Friday morning we supply breakfast for the entire shop, you know, as a little treat because the week is over. Barbecue. Barbecues. We'll do barbecues for lunch. Yeah. And, and how do you guys so. interface with other members of the Santa Fe community here, you know, the business community? <sighs> well, our, you know, our customers downtown, but what we learned, I learned. I mean, Aaron is a good example, right? Yeah, so. yeah. I learned a long time ago, though, not to trust, not to count just on Santa Fe, we, but to get yeah. off the side of the mountain and look nationally so so that really we probably have maybe eight to nine percent of our gross sales in town yeah. okay the yeah, rest is minimal. outside of town yeah, yeah. And, and you ship internationally and, and oh, yeah. we yeah. ship internationally and yeah. one of the benefits of being a local in santa fe or visiting um you know our fine city is we do have a, a small gallery open that is connected to our studio mm -hmm. where is where we have an outlet for our seconds or discontinued items that we sell for half off oh. to the public mm -hmm. um so that you know that's where you get a, a, a lot of neat yeah. neat grabs plus, I know. plus we support any charity knows that i'm a softy they can hit me up for any any donation a for a silent donations. auction or yeah. Any of this, uh, we do quite a bit of that with uh, any any schools and, and we, any charities. And we also, you know, our head our, our head grinder right now, he was 15, and um, for yeah. school he needed to do an internship in a career field he was interested in, and he wanted to work on knives. And his teacher called, and we don't. We don't employ teenagers, you know. I mean, we're we. It's a dangerous profession. I said no, <laughs> unless you're the owner's son. <laughs> yeah, ah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, um, she talked Bill into into letting this kid come in, and he came in, Jared, and we put him right on the hardest machine we have in the shop for a solid eight hours all day long. You know, you want to know what knives are? Do you want to yeah, know what it's all about? This is what it's about. You're basically, trying to wear him out. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know. It, 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 reality yeah and at the end of the day i will never forget saying you know so jared what'd you think of it and he just said yeah my back hurts <laughs> 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 he's 15 years old yeah so the next year but he worked all week and you know we didn't uh it was he wasn't supposed to be compensated we did compensate him because we didn't feel like it was right no, we paid him yeah and then the next year he had to do it again and he came back he did such a good job the following year that we said when summer comes, if you want to come in and work with us part time, then we'd be willing, you know, for the summer, we'd be willing to do that. And we yeah. don't do that because our training process, I mean, is like, a, it's like a year to a year and a half. You don't just walk in off the street and Nine pick months. up a knife and. I must even just feel a little bit confident. Yeah. I mean, before individual. you really feel comfortable in your job and you really feel like you know all aspects of it because we're teaching you everything because nobody else does this, you know, but us. And then Jared came back for the summer, and he's been with us 10 years. We never left. Wow. <laughs> he's, one of the and he's one of the biggest assets we have. Best assets we have to the Stoneworks. Um, the level that he's improved his position 
and uh, the overall quality, the overall quality. of our product um, is, is is literally mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and um, did he do the work on this knife right here? Yes, he did. That's he awesome. spearheaded um, pretty much the whole production process of the grinding mm -hmm. and the finishing yeah. of that knife. If you if you would see the first version we had, it wasn't that nice. Yeah. He says you have a vision in your in your head, but you don't exactly know how to quite get there until you again, you know, you know. Follow through, make your mistakes, mm -hmm. revise them, correct them, proceed to a different direction until you finally feel that you're confident with the product that you have. Um, but uh, he's, he's pretty much our shop foreman back there. One of the youngest gentlemen back there, but uh, the, the go-to person for each department of the shop as he is extremely level handed level headed um i've never seen him flustered as i've probably you know i've turned gray by the age of uh 33 for the record i'm i'm older quite a bit older than um, <laughs> and, and and uh it nothing seems to phase him and yeah. uh, he, he's the gentleman i can always lean whenever on whenever we have a problem we go to jared and he can figure it out he's, i don't know it's amazing yeah, yeah he is it, very amazing gifted. guy it's very been gifted. really amazing to watch him grow into the adult yep. that he is yeah. you know, today yeah. as well as i'm sure there, other there's employees. about 10 of them back there that i think i raised as well <laughs> as some of the, our long-term employees that have known miles and i since we were children yeah. you know i mean these That's guys wild. were working for bill when we were snot-nosed little kids as they kept, like to tell us sometimes yeah. yeah you know and i mean and to for us to come in and for them to uh for everybody to work together to make the best product is you know our biggest goal yep cool before we wrap up, maybe you, each one of you can share with our audience the uh, number one lesson that you've learned. And it can be actually, you guys can all have one if you want, but uh, number one lesson for people who are thinking about starting their, com their own company, for people who are you know maybe struggling with their small business, what's the number one lesson you've learned along the way? Don't quit. Don't quit. As long as you don't quit, you got a chance. As soon as you quit, you're done. You just don't quit, you just keep on going. Many times I was ready to toss it in, but you just keep on going, and then something happens that goes, yeah, that's why I kept on going, because <laughs> cool. something happens. Yeah, uh, don't give up when you fail. Okay. You're gonna fail, period. Everybody's yeah, gonna you're fail. You're gonna fail. Yeah. You know, and if you don't, if you don't roll the dice and try, you yeah. don't learn, and you don't know I mean, how to go with, forward. With my company, I'm nine nine years into it, and we changed our business model eight times before becoming profitable two years ago. See, yeah. so, see, yeah. I mean, you just I, but you see, don't know yeah. until I'm more you do it. I'm the seat of the pants guy. I just take it and go <laughs> with it. Yeah. And it's not a good way to be. You it need a business not. model and all that jazz. I never had that. I said, hey. I can sell this. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, Period. Bill is a salesman through and through. Yeah. He always has been and always will be. <laughs> There's almost nothing greater in life than succeeding on a vision that you had for your business. Mm -hmm. I have never felt the, the, the gratification I have had with the various mm -hmm. ventures that Anna and I um, have had over the last two to three years where we really kind of excelled our business. Yeah. And that has come with numerous failures, times where I went home and I just didn't know if, our, if we could do it in, in the capacity that I wanted us to do it in. And once you succeed, you will never go back to doubting yourself. So I continue, continue and push and work your ass off. Let me ask you a question real quick. So, one part that's interesting about that advice, which I've you know done talks and mentored people and given people that advice as somebody who started my company in 2009, there's also a dark side to that. And you have to be careful because yes. they kind of keep pushing forward. I've known people who kill themselves because yeah. and they, they kind of push mm -hmm. so hard and mm -hmm. they become so deeply intertwined with the identity of the business yeah. that the failure doesn't feel Destroyed like a failure them. of the business. It it's feels like personal. a failure of the self. Yes. One time I was working a shot show and I went over to the Benchmade booth and Lester D'Assisi, the, the owner of the, of the Benchmade, was in a corner away from the booth pacing back and forth. I went over and said, Lester, how the hell are you doing? He went, oh boy. I said, yeah, isn't it great to be self-employed? He says, yeah, it's great. You worry all day, you worry all night. Yeah. And there's a lot of truth to that. And I, 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 to elaborate on what you were saying, I completely agree. And I think sometimes people, once you get a little bit of success, they feel like they, okay, 
I'm never going to fail again. And that's not, that's just not the way it is. And then when they do, they're so broken by it, they don't have the will to go forward. Fear of you failure, that a failure is nothing more than, well, I won't do that again. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's everybody's... Getting out, it's getting the no's out of the way and looking for the yeses, which yeah. is just what sales is. Yeah. That's when, like a, when that's you're Edison. getting rejected from a sale, that's not your sale. That's a no. Goodbye. Look for the yeses and go with them. Cool. You know, but you have to watch how you have to watch how cocky you get too in success. You know, that can take you down faster yeah. than anything. Yeah, you'll get smacked down immediately when that happens. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's something that I tell myself and I tell other people. The moment that you think you have anything figured right. out, you're screwed. You're screwed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that's yeah. The, yeah. that's the best yeah. piece of yeah. small and, business and, advice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the best advice yeah. that, that my wife tends to, tends to tell me over the past four to five years is work life balance. Work life balance. <laughs> work life. And there may there may come to a point where you don't feel like you have it. Um, but just just continue to try to grow on that because that's very important as well. That the is business true. isn't your identity no. in life. No, um, it, it can help you you know create one or, or a vision for yourself, but don't let that overcome you. Okay. Always continue to have that balance. And yeah. and before I mean when I first started, I wanted so much to. Uh, take it over for my dad so that he could retire. I wanted to just do everything that he ever, anything he told me to do, I wanted to do. And Stoneworks did become my entire identity. I mean, I was in my 20s and I was here at 7 a.m. till like six o'clock. I didn't go out, didn't do much, you know? I mean, everything I did was work related. Everything was work involved, every single instant until I got breast cancer. And then I was like, wow, if I die tomorrow, am I gonna be happy with what I've done so far? Not to say I wasn't proud of it, but there were other things that are important too that I was pushing off to the side, like my own interactions, my own happiness, my own travel, my own time for myself. And you have to make that balance. I'll also say that's when I saw Miles step up and I got breast cancer a day after your 30th, the yeah. 31st. Yeah, the day I, I was diagnosed, the day after my 31st birthday. 31st birthday with breast cancer. And she had a year ahead of her of chemo and radiation and she had a job to do that was not working here. And she did as much as she could. She'd be here, but she was gone quite a lot that year. And that's when I saw Miles become a man. Period. That's, that's powerful, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He, he stepped up. He stepped you up. Guys, you guys must be keeping some onions here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, there was nothing. No, I, I had, I had to turn my job over to Miles. You know, I was here every day. I wasn't here all day every day, but I was no. here every day, yeah. except chemo days. Yeah, and and right. Miles jumped right in and never once made me feel bad about it. He took over everything and he just, he ran with it. He just, you know, I mean, he, it was, it was all the responsibility that he needed here at the shop, and it just, it, you know, that's life happens for a reason. Things happen for reasons. Love yeah. Even the hard things. All right. What a beautiful, touching, powerful, difficult thing to sign off on. Um, where can people find you and your business if, if people are interested in your beautiful products and your knives? So what's your address As here? long as I'm alive right here. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, our address is uh, 3790 Surios Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Our phone number yeah. is 505-471. 3953. Our website is one word.com. Yep. And uh, we have mail order catalog. If you're ever out and about at a retail show, look for us. If yep. you're at a wholesale show, check, look for us. You we just might and be. And you there. guys have an Instagram account too? Yes, yeah, we do. Yes. Facebook Please. and Instagram. And our Instagram is just starting to really take off. So We're really. a little late to the game, but yep. you know, if you, if you loved it, we'd love it if you would follow us. <laughs> as we think we have a fantastic page yeah. um, and this very interesting product. With a lot of cool. Brighten up your day. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, Bill, Anna, Miles, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. It was fun. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show, share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time.
Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.